Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we have a great event for you today. Um, we'll have 7BC do a reverse pitch and then we'll have a couple founders pitch at the end as well. Um, we also want to make sure to tell you just to, if you have any questions during the session, just drop them in our chat box and we'll get to them when we can. Uh, and with that, I'll introduce our CEO, Hall Martin, to come up and take the reins. Great. Thanks, Shane. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Hall Martin. I'm the CEO and founder of 10 Capital. I know many of you and I'm glad to see so many familiar faces out there today. And was uh, happy that when Andrew said he could actually join our reverse pitch because he's one of the most vibrant, interesting VC managers I've seen in a long time. He's based here in Austin. He's got a, quite a range of uh, deals and uh, information about the markets that are out there. And so love to hear more about from Andrew about the what he's seeing in the marketplace and what he invests in and share that, that information with you guys. So like I say, if you want to go ahead and type in questions as we go along, we'll pick those up as we get going. And then afterwards, we have uh, a couple of pitches that I think you'll find very interesting as well that uh, follow along what Andrew is doing as well. So hopefully, hopefully you can stay for that as well. With that, Andrew, why don't you come on up and tell us more about yourself and your fund? And uh, let's, let's just kick off into the reverse pitch here. Okay, awesome. I'm going to set my timer for 25 minutes so we leave a ton of time for questions you know, if folks want to get into that. so. Paul, Shane, thanks so much for having me. My name is Andrew Romans, and I'm the general partner of 7BC Venture Capital. For the founders um, in the session, we're actively investing. We actually invested into company number 17 out of Fund 3 today into an Austin company called Umbra. So check out Umbra, U-M-B-R-A dot space. It is a super cool company that we're incredibly excited about. And we're doing an SPV for LPs in our fund to invest alongside the fund. So we wired today, we'll be closing an SPV in the coming week or two for that. But for founders, we're generally looking for software startups that have a minimum of $100,000 of monthly reoccurring revenue. So software that are kind of hitting an annualized 1.2 revenue run rate, that's sort of our sweet spot. And then we'll double down and invest. We, we kind of think of that as late stage seed, and then we'll double down to series A. But what I thought would be fun would be to walk through a couple slides that are not like a hard sell for our fund, but a bit more informative. And then it kind of gives some context of how we fit into the market and how we see the market. Um, we are raising capital for uh, 7BC Venture Capital Fund 3. So new investors that come into the fund before the end of the month, December 31st, get into an existing portfolio that they can see and touch that's already going up in value. So if someone invests in the fund, you're already up in value. So we are working around the clock, simultaneously investing, deploying capital as a VC fund, but also raising LP capital. And we're getting ready for fund four to start taking capital into fund four next year. So... I want to talk about how a recession or economic downturn impacts um, startups, VCs, and angels and investors that invest in VC funds. You know, you can debate if we're in a downturn or, or a recession or not, but there's certainly been a market correction from the very frothy spring and summer of 2021. So put, put simply, um, valuations come down. And you see multiples of SaaS companies on the stock market were typically normally trading at 12X. So the company's got a million dollars of annual revenue. They're valued at $12 million. Obviously bigger numbers if they're on the stock exchange. That was kind of hitting like 40X and crazy multiples reminiscent of the dot-com craze and raging days. And then the stock market crashed, you know, what with Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the crypto market crashed. And you see multiples hitting like 5x. So not at 12, not at 47, but at 5x. And there's typically a little bit of a lag between the private markets of venture back deals and angel back valuations coming down to get in line with the stock market. But if the stock market crashes by 40%, it's not a 40% crash of the valuations of the pre money valuations of the startups that we and Hall and Shane are investing in it actually goes down more because what typically happens is the company in ancient times would sell 33% in 
in, in a funding round. So the math used to be really easy. If Shane shows us a deal and we invest in it, if we put 5 million into it, that's the size of the financing is 5 million. You double that number to get to 10 million is the pre-money. So the pre-money valuation is 10. We put 5 million into it and a third of the company has been issued to us. So there's dilution of 33% to insiders, founders and existing incumbent investors. These days they're selling 20%. So what, what was happening in like the summer of 2021, companies got good unit economics. They spend $1,000 to get a new customer. They maybe have like a two month payback that they've generated 1,000 of revenue within two months. And then they'll generate 18,000 in the lifetime value of the next few years from that one customer. So the VCs are like, all right, we put in a million dollars at the top of the sausage machine. We get 18 million back in a two month payback. When the companies were raising money in the go, go, go frothy market before the crash, the company is like, all right, let's raise 25 million, which is driving like a hundred, 120 million pre-money valuation. The stock market crashes and they say, oh, let's just raise like seven and a half million on a 30 million pre. So the valuations literally go from like a hundred plus million down to 30 million. And we're, we're not day traders. We're going to hold that for three to seven years, by which time the market will have recovered. So, so valuations coming down was a good thing if you're investing actively you know, in these companies. The next thing is austerity. The company that raised 25 million is going to have a 24 month runway, maybe an 18 month. We like to see 18 month runway go to 24 month runway from a financing. So when you raise money, that should last you at least 18 months that give you 12 months to execute. And then you've got, you can run your VC fundraising process for the next round with a calm six months of cash to meet payroll in the bank. We like to see a 24 month runway now, but if the company went from 25 million funding round now to 7 million or 5 million now, that means they're gonna make that 5 million last for 18, 24 months. It's the end of free Ubers and royal Michelin star restaurant lunches for all the royals that work in these startups in San Francisco. So we see that austerity is a good thing. Um, the other thing that happens is the large tech titans put in a hiring freeze. So we're not competing with Google offering insane healthcare and dental for your dog um, that we can hire these people to work at our startups. And everything is about talent and execution. So it's amazingly good that we um, that the big tech titans are less competitive. And in fact, they lay they do layoffs. They always want to fire people, but you need three lawyers in the room to fire a triple protected minority or someone that's being difficult. You got to document it here. They just fire ten percent to their staff, and that's a good thing. They also get back to their core business, and so these offshoots become startups that want to keep working on whatever that project is. And that becomes a recession born startup. Um, so basically it's all about talent and it's easier to hire people and it's less expensive to hire people. You don't have to offer crazy free Uber and Michelin star lunches for all the employees. There's a, you know, during the really frothy days when we were doing DD on companies, sometimes they were saying, look, you're asking just a lot of questions, Andrew. You're, you're trying to figure out my revenues. Is this non-reoccurring? Was this automated software? Are we pivoting? Like it's today's Wednesday. We're going to close this by Friday. Are you in or are you out? Now with the market crashing or correcting, they're ready for DD. Those same CEOs are saying, I'm ready to go through all of your DD. You'll understand everything before you accidentally invest in our company. So that return to sanity is just great, great stuff. You know, large companies, small companies need to be smart in, do they hire three people to do something as human manual labor? Or can they outsource that to one of our startups that have automated and made software to do that? So that becomes must have technology, either to lower lower expenses or, or drive revenues, you know, or bring value. So I kind of think whether there's a recession or not, technology, 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 it's progressing. Of course it is. We're automating human workflows and tapping into data sets, creating must-have 
must have technology. At the end of the day, this is kind of like my first slide. Valuations come down. We'll end up owning more of the company. They're not going to spend stupidly of like giving out $100 to a customer for $50 of revenue. They, they start being like raise money to become default alive or profitable. If you can, every round happening now should theoretically have an operating plan to get the company to profitability from today's current round. And that's just a great way for the founders to not get screwed over by raising too much money from VCs that they have to pay back. And so it's better for the founder. This sounds like, you know, this, this might sound a little bit like investor good, founder bad. I don't think so. I think that when you're forced to raise smaller rounds, have austerity, scrutinize every investment decision at the startup layer, you'll have better outcomes. You'll be focusing on sales, not on executive assistant nonsense. Um, so this starts talking a little bit about uh, where we fit into the market. So from left to right on the on the x-axis, you've got pre-seed. So that's like pre-product, pre-revenue. Then you kind of have like demo day, seed. Then you get into late seed, series A and B. And then since the dot-com crash, companies stay private forever you know, there's confusion of like numbers of like how much venture capital was invested in Germany. It's like, look, there was one growth deal. You're calling that VC. It's at a multi-billion dollar valuation. That that would have IPO'd in the ancient times of the 90s when I was a founder, you know, but you have this kind of pre-IPO phenomenon of the late stage growth. So I'll show where we fit in, but also how we see the market and how it shifts historically and even now when you have an economic downturn. So on the y-axis, if you're investing, if you're high up, up here, that's bad. That's like you bought yourself a penthouse apartment in Austin that was that should be sold for 5 million and you paid 10 or 15 million. So being high up is overpaying. Being low means you paid 2 million for a $5 million penthouse in Austin. So you're getting a good deal. So I typically think if you're doing institutional pre-seed and we're not, we do a couple of, I'll talk about where we fit in, but we'll do a couple of pre-seed deals, but we typically, I'm actually considered old right now. So I know a lot of people. So a lot of the pre-seed deals that we're doing, I invested in their last company. I knew the founder for 18 years or 15 years, and we know she's going to have no problem oversubscribing this round. She'll have no problem making tech that she's saying she's going to make, and she'll have no problem raising another funding round and another funding round. Like we barely even need to introduce them to a hundred VCs to get the next round done. So by the time that thing goes badly and runs out of money, we'll, our portfolio will be generating good news to make up for that. And those pre-seed deals we do are pretty small checks relative to the total size of our fund. But I, I have a lot of friends that just do pre-seed. It's like Ron Conway stuff. They invest in three, four companies a week they try to keep the pre-money below 3 million or even below 5 million. So like Ron Conway gets like 250K check into an Uber at below 3 million. So they're, they're, they're not overpaying when they're institutional and they're good at it. There's of course idiots doing like 100 million pre's on a pre-product, pre-revenue company. You know, shame on them. I guess they, they made their money doing something else. They're not good investors. Right here, this is sort of demo day. I don't know if you can see my pointer very, very well. This is like, the seed round where the the um, you know uh, demand and supply ratio is like there's a lot of demand because there's a lot of tourist people logging in on the Zoom or in you know the, the the computer history museum for a Y Combinator demo day and they tend to overpay. You gotta overpay if you're gonna play in this area. So we do invest a little bit at demo day, but not a lot. Now here's where we really come in. So demo day is over. The company is now really getting into revenue. They're hitting at least 100K monthly MRR. That's a 1.2 annualized revenue rate. All those demo day tourists are hard to track down and they're not writing checks big enough. So this is the late stage seed. This is what Series A used to be before the San Angelo Road funds got supersized. And so we like to play there. If I were investing 100% my own money, I would do 70% of the fund there and then 30% in the Series A. And we're investing my money. I'm an LP in the fund and Hall and Shane know that, but it's mostly other people's money. And I just don't want to ever have a bad vintage that I can't 
that I have to what get a job at IBM or something. So I want to make sure that our organism continues to live and survive forever. So we do about 30% of our money goes into the late seed and 70% is concentrated on A. And we think this is the optimal risk reward inflection point. This brings our fund to literally a 15X performance cash on cash. So if you put 100K in, you're getting 1.5 million back or a million in, you're getting 15 million back. If you're investing earlier, there's so much diversification to neutralize that risk that even if, you know, if you're in Ron Conway's fund and he's in Google and he's in Uber and all these things, that that the bad failures drag down the winners and the you'll make money. I think it's almost impossible to lose if you're good at it and you're in this deal stream doing pre-seed investing, but your total returns for the fund are capped. Um, if you're investing in series B and later, these companies, all the decisions have been made. It, th they have product market fit. Any you know network the VCs are offering is a bit discounted. And these things just get priced at lower. I mean, imagine this, Shane, er, er, Hall, imagine you and I had a $1 billion fund. And after it's all said and done, we 2X the fund. One, the management fee would enable us to double Shane's salary, of course. But if we 2X that fund, you and me, and we're 50-50 partners at the GP, we have $1 billion of profit. We have 20% carry performance fee on that. That's $200 million. That's enough to pay for a lift ticket and a cabin, right? We can live on the 200 million. And if we're doing that fund every three years, God bless our investors that love us for making a 2X return. So the big funds just don't care about a, a big performance because Shane and I can live on the 200 million every three years. Whereas for us, we're a small $50 million fund. If we deploy fund money here, we're dragging down the performance of our fund. But our founders love us. We, we're like Gordon Gecko insider traders, but legal. We have information rights. We have pro rata equity rights. They actually can't raise money without letting us invest in the future rounds. And we're diversified. So we want to drop into our winners where there's a 2X within 12 months. That's good for some of our LPs. We Maybe, maybe if it drags on for two or three more years, it'll be a 4 5X it's definitely not going to break a 10x when you're investing in these late stage deals. So what we do is we like to invest in uh, the late stage growth via SPV. And sometimes like we just invested into Umbra in Austin today, and we're creating an SPV for our LPs to co-invest with us. And we could move a big chunk of money where there's still room for a big pop, but we will probably be investing in Umbra all the way up to exit. Now they say this is the last round and they're never going to raise more because they're profitable on papered revenue. But I think there will be a liquidity, employee-wide liquidity program and we can get money into it on a secondary this coming summer, I believe. But so now I'm going to talk about where we are. So our fund one is at about a 33%, 33 and a half IRR. The multiple on invested capital, the MOIC, is right now above a 4X. I think it might even just moved higher, but we're expecting it'll end up as a 7X. We thought we knew everything going into fund one. With fund two, we, we seem to be getting better at it. It's at about a 4.5X roughly cash on cash. And the methodology for calculating MOIC for us is share price. That um, uh, what's the share price we invested in? So, you know, our check, you know, with, with the pre-money and the number of shares, it'll have a specific number. And then what's the share price and the number of shares we own based on a completed funding round. So some of these companies have like 20X revenue, they're profitable, they're not raising more money, but um, we're flat on that because the share price has not moved. They haven't raised more money. Whereas other ones were saying they've raised at a higher valuation, but they're in rough waters. We're actually calling that zero. So I think we're going to like 3X from where we're at by the time this is done, and that'll be a 12X. Um, so in case people don't know, a good VC fund typically makes a 3X cash on cash return. They might have a blowout vintage of making 5X, and they might have like, it is what it is, one and a half or 2X. So benchmark wise, we're really uh, at the top uh, at the top of it. On investment thesis, our primary thesis is software companies that are automating human workflows and tapping into data sets. 
And if you look at Umbra, like today's investment, that's completely different. They're launching these three and a half million dollars. By the way, they pay one million to SpaceX to launch their satellite into outer space. But the whole total cost of one satellite is three and a half million and they live for five years and anyone can log in and buy a photo image with this radar. They can see through clouds, they can see through trees, they can get underground. They're making a lot of money from Ukraine right now, but there's other places. So there's a lot of military, but there's also um, uh, people can see how much oil is in those oil containers and they can track ships and people are buying and selling oil based on that and offering that as a product to traders. So we, we, we move a little bit outside of this thesis. I knew Matt Mickelson. Uh, I, I invested in his company Backplane with Joe Lonsdale. Joe Lonsdale was a co-founder and chairman of that company. So I go way back with these guys. And all of us moved from Silicon Valley to Austin. So sorry for your property tax going up, but what else were we going to do? Um, so this is a little bit of, and I'm almost coming, getting ready for questions to start thinking of questions about our fund or about the market or anything at all. Um, this is where about 30% of our fund cash, our dry powder, is going into seed and late seed. Theoretically, and, and you need diversification. So if you're out there investing in single shot companies or SPVs, I, you know, I think you need to have at least 25 companies to neutralize the risk for late stage seed. So we'll do about 18 to 20 companies that have 100K MRR. So they're at they're at a 1 million plus run rate at the time of our first entry point. And we'll diversify enough that I don't think you're really going to lose money because some of them will run out of money and our money's gone. Some will sell for something. We had half our money back. And a couple of them make like literally a 50X return, 17X return, a 3X return, and this makes money. Um, but about 60 to 70% of our money is going into Series A. We're trying to optimize for Series A. Umbra was actually a Series B, but, you know, so there's some of that, but we still see a chance to make minimum 10X return as plausible. If somebody shows you a 50 million pre, that means to make a simple 10X, you got to get liquid at 500 million. So a 50 million pre money valuation, get liquid at a 500 million valuation to make a 10X. And that's not the real world. We're going to get diluted by 50%. So you got to sell at a 50X to get to 500. You got to sell for $1 billion to make a unimpressive 10X return for yourself or your fund. That's not going to do it for us. We got to see a bigger return. So this is the balance. You know, you don't need as much diversification when you're the companies have got three to 10 million or even 80 million in revenue on that A, B point. So this is more of like a, smaller level of diversification where when one of those exits, there was fewer of them and it was a bigger percentage, 70% of the fund to have a big impact. Um, uh, I could even close with this. So making a 15X, 12X, 7X return is pretty damn good, but how old are you now? How old are you going to be when this thing is done? VCs are lying to themselves and to into their investors, limited partner investors, when they say, oh yeah, we're gonna return the whole fund in three, four years. Let me tell you what reality looks like. You get on a call with your CEO and they're like, oh my God, I thought we were gonna exit last year. Now you're talking about getting through 2023 and the first exit won't come until at least 2024. We've been in this thing since 2014. God damn it, it just takes so long. So what we're doing is we're returning the fund faster. Remember how we invest in seed, late seed, and A, and a little bit of B? But we want to do SPVs for those C, D, E, F rounds. What we're doing is we say to our LPs, here's a memo, here's an update. Maybe you met the founder at our barbecue. You have three options. Do you want to take option one? We're selling between 5% and 25% of what the fund owns in this one company that's doing a big growth round at a huge uptick valuation. We're, let us wire you money back. So with one little sale of 5 or 25% of one company, we can return maybe 20%, 25% of your check that you paid in. And we hope to do this after 12, 24, 36 months. So long-term capital gains, and we'll leave the remaining 75, 95 to ride that winner into the sunset for the ultimate 
you know, crystallization of a IPO or M&A exit liquidity event. Option two is you're like, well, with, now that they raise that money, it's going to probably 2x in valuation within 12 months, recycle my exit into the SPV. I want to stay in the deal. So each LP can do their own math and choose and make their own decision. Option three is recycle. And I want to get a 2x to 5x exit in a relatively short period of time with a perceived zero risk of it going down. Like the, not even Kevin Spacey could sink that ship at this point. I'm in for, I'm happy for the two to five X. So that means some of our LPs put cash into the SPV. We use some of that cash to pay off our other LPs um, to return the fund faster. So I think it's just straight up rude and practically dishonest or unethical to say, hey, look, we invest in this company at 8 million pre or 16 million pre. And now uh, we're not returning any of the money and this is taking forever. Oh, by the way, we're on our fund four. Do you want to wire money into fund four? I haven't even paid you back from fund one, two, or three. So I'm pretty much done there. If somebody invests, they're getting into an existing portfolio company. We often invest before the big name VC or alongside the big name VC or even after the big name VC. You know, we could make 20 slides that show all of the, you know, Sequoias and first rounds and batteries and Bessemers that we've co-invested with. I think your statistical chances of making a lot of money go up. All right. So I got myself on the timer. I'll be true to my word and <laughs> shut up. Well, great, Andrew. Appreciate that. Great information and have some good questions coming in. First one, and I'll just go through them, is the fund size. How big is your fund right now? Right now, we are... Uh, getting close to being fully subscribed at uh 50 million we were saying 45 million but we're close to we're close to being uh done with this one so we're already talking about people about investing in fund four if if i were a 30 year old dynasty vc that just raises their hand with placement agents on monday and the billion point three fund is closed by friday i wouldn't have any overlap but we'll end up with like probably a little bit of overlap of We'll be investing in new companies that'll get cash from fund three and fund four so that we're never a zombie. If Paul Martin hears that I'm out of cash for new investments, he doesn't want to meet me for lunch anymore. So I don't want that to ever happen. So we make sure that the next fund is in so that we keep getting invited out for coffee and drinks by, you know, the guys with the deals. Great. Next question is a little bit different. Were you surprised that A16Z invested $350 million in Adam Neumann? Um, no, no, I, it did not surprise me. I think that, um, you know, Andreessen Horowitz has a problem that I don't have. They have just billions and gazillions of dollars burning through their jeans and underwear. It's like a problem for them. So they, they, they when they see a safe home to write, what was it like a three hundred and fifty million dollar check? They're like, "All right, dude, I think I might take the rest of the day off," you know, because like, <laughs> like it's it's not easy to move that much money, and they're able to justify it, um, and so they did. Great, not something we would do, right? So, next question: Are you saying that angel groups would be better advised to invest in VCs, thereby thereby getting into your middle sector? Oh yeah, you know, this is a funny thing I've noticed that like. The whole system, like let's blame benchmark capital for, for this. The whole kind of like Silicon Valley, global Silicon Valley system has conditioned private individuals investing out of their own savings that they should take bigger risks than the VC funds, even though they'll never achieve the diversification commensurate to neutralize it or struggle at it unless they quit their job and hire a team. And they should wait longer for the exit. So the time delay between entry point and exit should be longer for the individual angel than it is for benchmark capital on fund 18, you know, and, and, and a whole lot of things. And you hear the angel go, oh, I, I never invest in double digit valuations, meaning I would never invest anything above, at 10 or above million, even though for the angel to get into the series DEF via RSPV and be, have a zero risk of it going down, it's within one to three years of cash coming back because this lady is like 80 years old it'd be nice if she could spend the return the game and not just leave it for her estate that that like they've been conditioned into thinking this is where we play or i've heard angels say 
yeah, you know, me putting in 25K into Andrew's uh, SPV for Umbra doesn't really have an impact on Umbra. I'm like, what are you, a philanthropist? You're trying to help Gabe and Matt Mickelson by philanthropically helping them solve cancer? It's like a joke. So I think that angels, in some ways, it's more suitable for them to invest later than earlier. And yet the world has conditioned them or not invited them to the party. So I hope angels continue to fund Bunsen burner science experiments. And we come in later, like the benchmark when they're at 100K MRR. But I kind of think they should be invited to the party. And I would say that I'm not going to say the name of a fund, but I think they're mostly worthless roadkill. I've raised over 300 million for my own funds. They promise you that they're going to introduce you to Larry Ellison. And what happens is they're on 47 boards. I know a big VC on Sand Hill, right next to the Rosewood, who is on was on 47 boards. And he kept me waiting. And I was like, dude, you've joined 10 boards in like the last 10 days. What are you doing? He says, oh, I'm getting off 10 because I'm joining another 10. That is a bad board member. I'd rather take the angel investor that's an LP and put her or him on four boards where they can be available before the board meeting, taking calls on a Sunday morning, present at the board meeting, not on their BlackBerry, whatever emails, and then introduce Larry Ellison after the board meeting like they promised. And that's a better board member. So I think angels belong in the game almost get the VCs out of the way, which will never happen, but allow them to participate. That is the value getting delivered to the startup. And if you're delivering value, startups will want your money and you'll get into deals at with DD and rational pricing. Great. Next question is, so pick a company you invested in, discuss the techniques you use to value it. Is it pure net present value from a spreadsheet or were you using some other formula? Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time, I could pick a really early one and then a really later stage and contrast them. I'll start with an early one, superhuman, uh, Raul Vora and Vivek. So Vivek, by the way, also moved from San Francisco. He's helping drive up the property prices here, uh, <laughs> lives around the corner from me. They, they, so superhuman was pre-product, pre-revenue. Raul had not recruited Vivek yet. He came into my office and said, I'm going to hire people to make this a real company. I have not incorporated yet. And I committed to it because Raul sold, report, sold his last company reported to LinkedIn for 12 million. And it was like an email thing. He had th four other co-founders. He didn't want to sell. He took the money. He's, my kids have been in his Lamborghini. He's a fun young guy in SF. And then he, he said, I want to continue the roadmap for that. And, I, and he personally can make the tech. So I knew he is a programmer that knows email that could make this vision work. And he would not struggle to raise money. He'd be oversubscribed. And I was lucky to be in the pre-seed round. And indeed, he made product. I was very involved with it from the beginning and still am. Um, and then I figured the worst thing is we sell this company for $12 million to LinkedIn again. He knows how to sell his company to LinkedIn. So I had like downside risk protection built in with my conviction that this will work. And, and in the worst case... I get my money back. I'm able to take a risk. That investment is going to return fund one multiple times. So like, that's a great one. With later stage, you know, I don't want to take up too much time on later stage. Um, yes, discounted cash flow is part of our thesis. Multiples is part of our thesis. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't want to say anything too confidential. We've got a company that's at, that was at 56 million top line revenue last year. And they raised like 106 in the summer of 2021, which changes the whole exit dynamics here. But like, we think that they're gonna sell, I mean, they're telling us when they hit 150 million top line. And then you start saying, what are the multiples we can get? And they'll tell you the multiples they think, and they'll, they'll justify it. We have a, a lot of LPs in the fund from Silicon Valley, New York, and Europe that are sell-side M&A tech venture-backed investment bankers. And we ask them, what do you think is a rational range of multiple for that? And so we back our way into the current valuation. We look at what we think that exit will look like, okay? And we look at what's the risk of getting from point A now to point B exit. And we say, is that multiple return to the fund big enough to justify fund money 
or SPV money. And we'll do both or one of those, you know, from the fund only, no SPV was possible. SPVs always lose to a fund, basically, unless you are got a pro rata incumbent guy. Um, but then there's only so much time you got to spin up that SPV. Um, so, so hopefully that answers uh, the rationale. By the way, when interest rates go up, the discount rate in a DCF gets higher and future returns are worth let, less when you bring them to net present today. Mm-hmm. Great. So Next founders question. should get rational on valuation. That's a good idea. So how do you view the use of venture debt to extend runway alongside a raise, especially in the current market environment? Venture debt. I, I've I've always been uh, one to embrace venture debt more than the average VC. Bill Draper, Tim Draper's father, once said to me, never, ever, never, never, never. It's always bad, always bad, always bad. And I'm like, well, you know, there is like a debt equity ratio, even for tax, if you're an accountant, I mean, for the later stage. I generally do not like to see venture debt come in too early. And it's something that in my diligence that comes up, I'm like, have you, do you have any venture debt? Ooh, how much are you paying? Is there a balloon payment? How much of your monthly burn is going to service the principal and interest on the venture debt? And that just puts more pressure and risk on the company. It's senior, it gets paid out first. And it's at the top of the liquidation stack. So when a company is sold, the, the, any debt is paid out first. It's something that we look at, but I generally think it it does make sense when the company's generating revenue. So Mark Tier Johnny, old friend of mine, used to be the lacrosse coach of my kids in Silicon Valley. He's now running venture debt at Pacific Western Bank, and they're they're now sponsoring my podcast. So if you watch my most recent episode uh, with one of my LPs who's in real estate for startups and SF, you see Mark come on and explain venture debt a little bit. And then he comes and says the says at the end. So I'm supporting him and he's supporting me. And I like, I generally like it. You know, you, you borrow money, you make 36 month payments back typically. And instead of getting badly diluted of 20% for that money, you're, you, you got a couple of warrants. They got a little equity kicker that's like two to 8% max, 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 max. And if you rate you raise five, you put two million of venture debt on top of that. It's like that kind of ratio. Great. Next one is tell us about your crypto investments. Do you have any? Um, I've not made any crypto investments from the fund. Uh, you know, we can do up to 20% of the capital as crypto. My crypto investments have been personal. Um, so you know, I'm a personal investor in crypto. And just like anyone asking this question, I try not to look at it. You know, I just try to not even look at it. It's, it's, it pisses off my wife. You know, if my kids knew about it, they'd be pissed as well. But but in general, in ge- we've invested into DigiShares, which is putting real estate on the blockchain. They're like tokenizing it. We're investors in FanVestor, which is like celebrities doing crowdfunding, but it's on blockchain. And we invested in the block crypto, which is like Bloomberg news for the crypto market. And these are all great investments and they're all equity investments where they sold me equity, not tokens. Okay, great. Last question. uh, And I wrote a book called Masters of Blockchain and the Rise of Crypto. So I know a lot about it. I mean, I, I interviewed, you know, I'm, I was speaking at three, I was keynoting three blockchain events a year, a week in 2016 and 2017, and even into 2018. Um, And I think that I was saying, I was very unpopular at these events. I'm like, right now you're raising money from unsophisticated retail investors doing no due diligence. How do you think this is gonna end? It's gonna go to F and zero, and the professionals will be invited back, and these companies will be raising money from like Paul Martin and me, not you know moms and teenagers in South Korea. I mean, how do you think it's gonna end? And I'd get almost booed off the stage. Prescient words there for sure. So Michael from Gunson asks, how do you resist pressure from VC or board to exit early when you know you're a billion dollar company in three more years? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And um, the two and 20 model with a 10 year term that can go to year 12 or even further with limited partner consent and the dynamic of you got to raise a new fund every two or three years. It's like that scene in a animal house where there's the devil on the one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder. The, the VC is like a devil being like, yeah, we got to like, you know, uh, sell this company. We're getting out funded. I think we're lucky just to get out of here. You know, it, that's bad. I mean, the, the VC's got pressure to put points on the board ahead of their next fundraise. 
DPI distributions to pay it in as opposed to MOIC and total value to pay it in, like paper returns. They got to they gotta wire the money back. Now, I'm getting around that by exiting early, by selling a little bit to our own SPVs. So I'm less of a devil and more of an angel uh, with the founder. I basically say, try to put the founder first and do what is in the interest of the founder. Because look, one of my companies is going to sell with or without my permission. And so we're, we're diversified enough. Our past track record's great. I don't have to put points on the board to keep Israel alive. You know, and, and some of these guys will pr pressure, you know, pressure into that. Ultimately, what I want to do is raise a $1 billion fund, not because I'm greedy, but because you got to be big to go public. And I want to have a publicly traded evergreen company so that if I invest in that company and there's an exit, that exit consideration cash and stock comes back onto the evergreen snowball and will turn $1 billion into $4 billion and $4 billion will turn into $20 billion over time. And we'll get the compound of the carry. that, And I'll go public 24 months after closing the $1 billion fund. So if anybody wants to talk to me about you know, helping me raise a billion dollar fund so we can go public. I'm telling you, founders who are asking this kind of question will choose us. I'll be on a panel next to some two and 20, 10 year term VCs saying, these guys are great, but they have to get their money out of you. And they're the devil on your shoulder. We are like, hey, I can invest in Apple computer in six months after the lockup of the IPO. I could hold the stock of Apple and ride it into a multi-trillion dollar company. So we will be like permanent family office never need to get out companies. And hey, you're all liquid. So shut up. And you're like, well, why are you paying the exit back to it? How do I, is, shouldn't there be an m and I'm like, are you asking that about when you invest in Microsoft and uh, Apple? Who's going to buy Microsoft and Apple? No, those are permanent companies that are going to get to, you know, 10 trillion plus valuations. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. That brings us to the end of this section. Anybody that wants to have further contact or questions with Andrew, we'll be glad to facilitate that afterwards. We'll reach out to you after this session. And with that, let's go ahead and bring on our first presenter, Todd Hardman of uh, Health Connects. Todd, if you can go ahead and turn on your video. and continue. Thank you, Hall. It was great. Thanks well. so much. Thanks, Thank you Andrew. very much. And we'll go ahead and switch sure. over and looking for your feedback on Todd's presentation as well, Andrew. With that, Todd, go ahead and kick off. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Let me pull up the uh, the charts here and see if we can get this going here. One second. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, enjoyed uh, very much your talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Todd Hardman. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Health Connects. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about a couple of things that are going on in the industry of healthcare that are pretty darn concerning. Obviously, the economic impact that we were just talking about from a variety of uh, mechanisms, obviously probably spearheaded by COVID and then the collapse of the financial layer. Uh, it's put a lot of pressure on healthcare to do better with a lot, a lot fewer assets and a lot fewer uh, staff available, if you will. So healthcare is eroding very quality people quickly. Um, so they don't need more big data. And thank, frankly, that's what's still being kind of pressured into health systems today and the care delivery side uh, to push analytics and bigger data. So what we have discovered is that the majority of data <clears throat> and information that's needed for care to get better with limited resources and to not put pressure on workflows and to not force re-engineering of workflows is precise individual patient data that is about small data. That is the only data that patients uh, need to know and doctors need to know to tell their patients about to get what they need for better care and outcomes. So that's what we deal in. We deal in patient insights at the right place at the right time. Here's the big, here's the big problem. <clears throat> There's no time left for the right information to be conversed with the patient in the exam room. Since uh, the 70s, we've gone from, from 60 minutes an hour to a patient visit now down to 10 to 12 minutes. That compression of time has really hurt what needs to be done for a doctor and a patient to understand what's next. The result is there's lots of information that's left on the table and the mistakes are mounting. <clears throat> The bigger problem now is that what comes from this is physician and staff burnout. The patient risk goes up for more harm. That's adverse drug events, readmissions. The workflow realignment uh, is needed. And the misalignment because of EMR pressures is unwarranted. So therefore the doctor-patient relationship is now 
uh, falling apart. <clears throat> at a bigger level, the US healthcare overspending is at a record level because there's really not looking and a mechanism looking at the whole patient for better insights. This is what we do. This is our solution. Our solution we call MPC90 for maximum patient context. What we do is take real-time information from social determinants of health, prescription information, and behavioral determinants of health. We call them NPC Life, Rx, and Mind. Those three insights provide up to 90% of every single patient's modifiable determinant layer. This allows us to look at insights on each of those branches and address the biggest things going on in the industry for things like engagement of a patient, chronic care management, where the huge expenses exist, transitions of, uh, of care from one environment to the other, things like adherence to medications, early detection. These are, this is where cost and where the systems of care, and more importantly, where value-based care is headed. So we support that across the continuum of care with the use of our data. Here's an example of how it works. Let's say a, a doctor wants to know something about Jane Smith. Well, Jane Smith provides her information. The doctor puts it into his tablet and sends, puts, it's a simple send button. It hits our platform, NPC 90. In 90 seconds, we provide our NPC mind survey of that patient's mental state. It is a patented uh, digital asset to allow a patient to mimic how they feel and think about their emotions and transfer that to our platform. Then in that same period of time, we gather their life and their prescription data. And then we send it right back in real time to the provider. No waiting for big data, no waiting for workflow, no waiting for other staff. It's immediately available for actionable insights for that patient and that doctor to decide what's next best for that patient. Here's an example of a report that may come back. This is one of any um, number of designs that we could create. But the key thing here is that we only surface the information that in a matter of seconds, providers can look at and immediately see what do I need to pay attention to and to focus that visit on that patient. Given we only have 10 minutes of time, I might wanna know what I really need to know. This is called precise information, where it's needed and when it's needed. Here's our AI strategy, just from the sake of our next layer. Today, we have three layers of health determinants that we talked about. That's the social determinant, the prescription layer, and the behavioral layer. These are 24 individual insights that we capture today. Our AI strategy is to connect the dots and show the relationships between what's going on with their life circumstances based on the drugs they're taking, and then what's going on with their mental status. When you can tie those three together, you've got the most sophisticated, most pinpoint information on any patient you need to touch for care management and guidance. This is how you get to optimize care. And this is what we're headed toward. And that's our AI strategy in a, nut, uh, in a quick, short nut case there. Now in market uh, development in our, in our platform, uh, we look at digital health market as our overall uh, uh, customer marketplace. The reason being is that they are getting crushed in this economy because those platforms that they've built and what we were just talking about with Andrew is they came in at heavy, they're well oversubscribed, heavily overvalued, and they're taking a crush into this next round and looking to down rounds uh, territory, which is a bad deal. They need help. They need pinpoint data, pinpoint value to maintain their value position and to be competitive in this highly new competitive space. Uh, market uh, consolidation is going to start to happen. They need a better footprint and their customers to uh, get those higher values as well. So what we've done is targeted the three most viable platform spaces for our platform. And we believe that's about a $5 billion TAM uh, on overall market opportunities. Here's how we go to market. We partner with such platforms. So we look at channel partners as our primary customer and we partner with them to again, monitor or match up with their platform of services with our data. They do the use cases based on their customers. We can map to each of these use cases on their platform, it's a simple API integration where they're touching uh, thousands and thousands of hospitals and health systems and care management. We can do that one to many, land and expand with a single partner. That's the market strategy.
Here's an example of how it can look. So we've carved them up by individual use case, as we just talked about. And here's 14, 15, 20 partners that we're currently working on right now. So our growth levers are pretty strong. Today, we've got um, uh, the consumption of our data from our platform today from companies like Walgreens, Johnson & Johnson, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Our strong growth levers to attract these kinds of players are about price competitiveness, but more importantly, value for what they need. They're looking for strong in uh, real-time data assets that can affect the, the, the long-term cost factor of the patients that they're trying to care for. So that's why we're getting that stickiness factor. We've had customers using us for multiple years now. Uh, we've had no loss of our uh, customers to date. Therefore, high stickiness is, is intrinsic to our platform because we have what these customers really need to have. Here's an example. Uh, this year, we've gone from Q2, Q3, Q4. Uh, you can see we've had some uh, substantial increases on our overall transactional volume. And by the year end, we expect to be well over 2 million transactions in our platform to date. So what we're trying to do here, we've got some, uh, some money uh, asked uh, for, the, for everybody. So we're at a phase one level. We're coming out of a bridge financing right now. We're about 50% subscribed into that. We're looking to raise about 500K on the balance of that. Uh, we'd like to close that out by the end of the year or first of next year. We could offer a convertible note um, with the terms and conditions that you see here. Uh, to the point of Andrew, our valuation we believe is quite realistic um, based on our current run rate, which is at about uh, pretty close to 100K per month. So we're, I think we're going to be at around a little over a million this year on our overall run. And we'd like to see if we could close that round out or at the same time, our secondary plan right away is to go to a larger raise, 1.5 to 2 million uh, fund. Uh, so we could then fully execute our plan to build out our AI platform and to penetrate the market at the level that we need to go to read our overall uh, financial goals. You can see what this looks like in our overall plan for the year. We think uh, coming into fiscal year close in 23, which is uh, uh, March, uh, end of March next year, we think we'll have an exit run of around 9 million and then we'll move into the subsequent layers uh, with a pretty good set of benchmarks for uh, revenue. Any questions? Great. If you have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat box. Andrew Romans, if you have a question, go ahead and just ask it directly. And my first question is, how long does it take you to sign up a channel partner for one of these systems? Is it a month, a week, or how long does it normally take to get them on board? Well, I wish it was a month or a week. That's a great ask. But typically, the sales cycles run somewhere between four to six months uh, to get through the natural discovery an alignment of service value. Um, and then so should they say, yes, let's go, then there's the legal side, some contracting work that needs to be done. Our contracts are not simple uh, user agreements. They do require PHI, uh, BAA type consents and pass down language that has to be understood to manage uh, patient information. But generally four to six months is what we plan on that. Our general customer acquisition cost we think is gonna run somewhere around $10,000. And we think that that return is uh, generally recouped in about month four to six, depending on the initial uh, run rate of transactions. Great. And how many channel partners do you have right now and how fast is that growing? So we have four right now. We think that our, our growth right now into Q4, we have uh, eight, uh, we have 15 currently that have indicated interest for Q1 activation. Uh, so that would be that would be great if we even took half of that. We'll be well ahead of plan. Uh, so we think that um, uh, right now we we could say four uh, four to five in Q1 would be our great uh, start to the year. Great. And what other partners are you working with, say in AI or those places? So we do have we're in terms of partners right now. AWS is our prime uh, big development partner for our core platform services. Uh, we do use other large uh, networks for data connectivity uh, that are bellwether platforms such as SureScripts, LexisNexis. Um, so we have uh, that type of backup as well. Great. Does the platform require any change of behavior from the patient or the physician at this point? Uh, absolutely not. Um, the, 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 if you call, it's, we're, call us complimentary. 
to whatever they're doing today. So we're not asking them to adopt any new workflows or any new um, uh, dynamic change to their uh, exchange with the patient. Literally 60 seconds before they walk into the exam room for the patient, they look at the report that I just showed. They will know 75% more than they would have ever known about that patient using today's methods. 75% more because they'll know what's going on with their thinking and concerns of their emotions, their moods, and their feelings. They'll know about their social and their life circumstances. Did they have income issues, transportation issues, uh, housing, food insecurities? We know all these things at a patient level and can produce them for a provider in, in seconds. Therefore, they know that walking into the room, such as are they taking two or three drugs that they shouldn't be based on the confliction of their therapy? We can give them that heads up and not waste the time trying to get it out of the patient. Then they can go right to a problem solution sooner. That's how we would work that. So it's very complimentary. Most importantly, incredibly enabling. This part of the stress of doctors today is not knowing what they need to know. So we take them from, from wanting to know, wish they knew, to absolutely knowing what they need to know. Great. And for the 1.5 million, what's the use of funds? What exactly are we going to be accomplishing with that? So we have three primary uh, directions for that hall. Uh, the key thing first is to build out the, re the remaining of our AI strategy. We want to get to that integration of the three digital assets that we have today to show the most high fidelity contextual insights of those three data elements. That's critical for the industry and users to know what's the relationship. For example, if a patient shows up and scores high on their depression or high on anxiety in their survey, we could also say, well, look at your drug regimen and find out that three or four of their chronic medications actually have depression and anxiety as side effects. So now what we allow the doctors to do is by that recognition, not over prescribe more drugs to treat something that may be causing the issue. Now they can be properly channeled to a behavioral therapist to match up what's going on first up here and then manage the drugs accordingly. Much better treatment strategies, much better outcomes come from that. That's great. Uh, we'll check to see if there's any other questions from the audience afterwards and get back in touch with you, but I think that covers it for now. Thanks so much, Todd, for your presentation. You bet. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Next up, we have Chris Hugman, a system surveyor. Chris, uh, if you could go ahead and uh, turn on your video and we'll uh, have your presentation next. Great. Thanks, Hall. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, hello, everyone. Glad to be with you today. Um, love, happy to tell you a little bit about System Surveyor, what we're working on, what we're doing. And so I'll pull that up here in just a moment. So thanks. So um, we've heard about some some great funds and, and fundraising investing opportunities. I want to tell you about a great opportunity in somewhat of a blue collar market. It's, a, it's somewhat of a forgotten segment, the electronic physical security market. Um, and we're building technology that's truly transforming how that market functions. And so, so I'll get into that. Uh, quick bit of background. Uh, before starting System Surveyor uh, a few years ago, I owned and ran a system integration company. That is a company that goes and sells and installs security systems. I'm based here in Austin, Texas. And with my company, we installed systems everywhere from the Texas State Capitol to the Department of Public Safety across the state schools and businesses and hospitals uh, throughout the area. So quite a bit of experience. And I recognize a problem that we were having that I'll talk a bit about. But first, I wanna talk about the, the, what I'll call the ecosystem. I mean, these are the people that are playing in the physical security market. And you'll see over on the left, the system integrators. These are the people that sell and install systems like my old company but they have to buy the equipment from somewhere. And so they'll buy the equipment, of course, from manufacturers, typically through a distribution channel. And those system integrators sell to technology managers. In my case, it was a, it was a capital of Texas uh, technology manager or, or hospital technology manager that then is responsible for the security of that, of that building. And so those are the three legs to the stool of the ecosystem that we really address. And we serve uh, a component in the middle that enables collaboration, accelerates design for, for those markets. And so here's the problem I was facing when I was in my company. 
And most, and 73% of the customers out there today face the same problem. Their salespeople are going out to site and they're relying on paper floor plans, handwritten notes, and photos on their cell phone. Now, when they leave the site, they have to pull that all together, send that over to a technical person, an engineer, and it, as you might imagine, it rarely gets through in a cohesive fashion. And that causes all types of problems down the line. Uh, it's very inefficient, number one. Number two is it inserts a lot of room for error and errors happen all the time. These companies live and die on their labor budgets. And if there's an error that's in place, they have to eat that from a labor. If it costs them a few hours more, they may have just lost all the profit on their job. And so that's why this, this uh, concise method of gathering information, validating with the customer is so important. Think of it as we are a visual-based uh, data set. We're a Google Maps for IoT platforms. In this case, a Google Maps for um, physical security. So in this case, you have a Google Maps, you wanna to go to a restaurant, you, you can pick up a restaurant here and that's the one I wanna to go to, but it also offers me other options. Very helpful, very intuitive, very visual. You know exactly where you need to go. And, and in fact, there's a massive amount of information that you consume very, very quickly. Well, if you compare that to what we're doing, even today, this is what we're doing. You can drag and drop, show where the map is, and then we can help you select some products. And I'm gonna show you that uh, on a quick demo clip here in a moment. But that's the, that's the objective that we're going for, is to be able to help guide users to the right products for the right application. And in the same time, assist manufacturers in selling those products. Because as you know, Google is not funded by users, it's funded by the advertisers. So a brief uh, demo, so this, in this case, I'm a, system, I'm a salesperson for a system integration company going out to visit a customer that wants to add a camera to their site, a video surveillance camera. So I pull up their floor plan. I've done a little bit of work for them here and they decide they need coverage in the back corner of their office because there's been some issue going on there. And so easily on my iPad, I use my finger, I drag and drop. It shows me where the camera, the view of the camera, we call that area of coverage. And over on the left, I can, I can adjust, okay, what level of camera do I want? Do I want a, a very high resolution camera or not? I can snap open the camera on the device, take a photo, and now I can annotate this photo so my installation technicians know exactly what to do after we close this job. It saves a huge amount of time. Then I can go in and define some of the characteristics you know, is this something that I need a lift for? It's a high traffic area. Those things that drive the labor costs. Functionally, what are some of the features that I need on this product? And I can choose those. I even have a list of products that are embedded in here that manufacturers offer to me that I can provide and I show their data set. So all in this 90 second review, I can show you the products that I'm planning to put in that, in that corner for that customer. And the customer can approve it. Typically what happens, the salesperson takes all their notes, they hide them from the customer because they're so in such a mess, go back, spend another hour developing a plan and, and have to schedule another appointment. And so the average, our, our users are cutting their number of appointments with customers in half and consequently their sales cycle in half. Quick a snapshot of where we are right, right now as a company uh, from an uh, annual recurring revenue standpoint, we're just at uh, just past 2 million. Uh, we have 1,000 accounts with almost 3,000 seats. Um, we've, our sales efficiency, we're, we're seeing a less than a 12-month CAC payback uh, selling direct to our users. And, uh, you know, our new MRR, we've been able to drive 55% uh, growth over the last, over the previous four quarters through, through the third quarter. So just to give you a snapshot of the size of the company, we have 12 employees. And so that's, that's where we are, uh, just from a, a current standpoint. Uh, because of our vertical market focus, here's a, a bit on the market itself. And I've broken this down by potential users and then serviceable market. And so we see 1.2 million users out there. And you know that represents... A, a little over a billion dollar market based on our current pricing. 
And so we we think we're going to get to each one of those markets with a decent penetration. And it doesn't take much, as you can see here, we, we just simply need to double our base in the next two years uh, to achieve more than 2x um, growth on the revenue side. So, so we see that as very low hanging fruit. Uh, so our revenue growth for the past 12 months, well, for 12 months through, through um, the third quarter, you can see was 77,000. So that's the 55,000. And uh, we're a SaaS based company. We sell to a market that has been um, hit to some degree by some of the economic challenges. There's been some consolidation. So we also see churn. And so, and part of the reason we're seeing churn is because of consolidation, but part of it is we need to do a better job executing our business. And that's what this round is about, is helping us deliver additional high value features and then execute better on our business. Um, and I'll tell you how we're planning to do that. Uh, so the first thing we need to do to execute on our business and, and uh, reduce that churn, but also drive revenue from existing accounts is promote the user engagement. We need better, we need some additional features that keep them in our platform more. And so what we're gathering some, we've implemented some uh, customer analytics to give us better visibility on what our customers are doing. We just did that uh, two months ago. Uh, we've added a customer success role uh, back this summer and he's helped us do that um, from uh, another large SaaS uh, company in this space. Um, and we need to address, there's some feature needs, some enhanced graphics capabilities, some improved navigation, things that we need to do just as part of evolving the product. And so those are things that we've heard from the market that we're responding to. And then also you see embed the manufacturer product lists. And when we begin to embed those product lists, now we can begin to foster, develop that market with manufacturers that, that they ultimately will end up paying us to be in the platform. And, and think about it for a moment. When, when a user drags and drop a security camera or any other device in our platform, that is an extremely qualified uh, lead for a manufacturer, for anyone selling a product. And oh, by the way, we have over 2 million um, devices added to our platform every year um, right now. So we definitely see that growing. Uh, and also facilitate deeper uh, customer uh, adoption. You know, certainly we're going to drive new revenue growth, and that's the other piece of the equation. We're going to be, over the next two years, we'll double our budget, our annual budget for mm -hmm. uh, our, our customer acquisition and, and including sales team and other activities that we're doing. Of course, build side pipeline and all these things that I won't get into a lot of the detail here, but we have a plan that we're, in, we're executing on now and we'll continue through the first of the year. Um, so we're on, from an investment standpoint, um, we're raising a, uh, $1 million round. I'd call it a late based on what Andrew said, a, a, a late seed round, um, to, uh, to achieve a, a 25, uh, a $5 million outcome by the end of 24. And here's the, here's a play, the, uh, the application of those funds, the outcome, uh, probably the most important aspect of this is that last bullet point is we want to initiate that product promotion business unit targeting a $3 billion uh, manufacturer marketing spend. Because here's the thing, if you go to, a, to Google, uh, your search page, you type in video surveillance camera, if you'll see, of course, three ads at the top of the page. If you click on one of those ads, those manufacturers just paid Google $15 an incredible amount of money for a single click on a camera that's probably never gonna be bought. So we can improve uh, those results dramatically because of our, our industry specific focus and what we're bringing to the market. So investment terms, uh, really need to get, I wanna get this done this year. Uh, we have a Series Y. It, it's, we're calling it Series Y because it's a preferred round. We have another preferred round, Series X, which I can give you history on that if you like. But it is a preferred round carrying a 2X preference. Um, the participation, uh, of course, with participation. 
Uh, Pre-money company valuation is 12 million. Of course, that's a little under 6X from an ARR standpoint. So um, as of today, I have 900,000 of that funded. And um, so I'm looking to finish out the 100,000 and just uh, and get this done and move into next year uh, ready to go. So that's that's system surveyor. Great. So we have a few questions for you. The first one up is what's the pricing model here? Yeah, pricing model is a subscription based. We're uh, monthly and annual subscriptions. We have about half either way. And uh, we do have a freemium offer. And we see 17% conversion between freemiums and a paid subscription without any assistance. And so we have that motion going on. Some call that product-led growth. And then we also have um, a good, better, best model from a paid standpoint, where our top tier is the negotiated tier for companies with over 25 licenses. Great. And when did the revenue shrinkage start? You, you know, do you have an MRR time graph of some kind to show when it started and stopped? I don't have a graphic uh, in this in this deck. We began. We launched the product in 2016, and so we were, you know, we were able to generate some revenue. In fact, I was not at the company. I was still working my other company at the time. And so once we hit 300 users, I, I divested myself and came over. So. Um, but it's the, uh, you know, I can pro certainly provide that information for those that are interested. Great. And what is your geographic footprint right now? Uh, geographically, we, 80, 85% of our users are in uh, in the U.S. or Canada, and, and we serve primarily the North American market. Uh, we've been discovered. We don't market to the, to the Europe or Australia or Latin America. But we've we have a number of users that are in those markets as well. Great. And how do you get new new accounts? What are your customer acquisition channels? Yeah, our primary uh, our primary lead source is our current customer referring us. So that's that's number one. Um, second, our second lead source comes arises from the manufacturers, and I mentioned that. And it's it's when a manufacturer gives us their list of products and they put it in our platform. They are encouraging their customers, which are common to us, to use System Surveyor to design the system because we have collaboration features that that user can now collaborate and invite the manufacturer representative into that project and they can, they can see everything that the, the user sees and weigh in on that. Which products are best? What would be the best application? Uh, maybe how to upgrade or, or upsize the, the project itself. And so a lot of value there in a lot of different ways because it saves the manufacturer a lot of time and support exchange, sending emails back and forth and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of work that we can do there. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're at the end of our time. I want to thank you, Chris, for your presentation. And we'll check with the audience for follow-up steps here. We took a poll here. We should have information from there. Anybody in the audience, if you want further questions or contact with Chris, we'll be glad to facilitate that after as well. That uh, brings us to the end of our presentation today, guys. I want to thank you for coming out and sharing the information. We'll be back uh, again with more of these events uh, later this week and next week. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thank you, Hall. Thanks. And for the audience, appreciate you guys joining us today. And for all the good questions you asked, we'll go ahead and put you in contact with the key people here today and hope to see you guys next time. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. You guys have a good day. Thanks.